Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining class this morning. Uh, before we begin, can I ask uh, Javina, can you please lead us in prayer? Sure, ma'am. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the beautiful class we are about to have. God, we invite our Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us as we read the scriptures, as we read the things on the lesson. Help us to open our eyes and mind and understand every little thing that our teacher is teaching. Be with her and guide her. I thank you for all my friends who have joined here. Help us to listen to your words and understand it and apply that on our life and be an example to everyone around us so that they can know that you are God and you are everything. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. Uh, so last Friday we were looking at uh, the doctrine of church, of the church, and we were looking at the sacraments. Uh, there are two sacraments, which are the two sacraments that the church observes. Which are the two sacraments the church observes? Water baptism and the Lord's table. Thank you, Zelatoli. So thank you, Bega. Baptism, water baptism and the Lord's table. Uh, so we looked at, um, uh, you know, uh, water baptism. Uh, what are some of the things that, uh, you know, uh, we learned regarding water baptism in our class on Friday? What is water baptism? Uh, why do we uh, uh, partake in uh, the water ba baptism? What are the what is the significance? Uh, what is the expression of water baptism? What is the symbolic uh, meaning of uh, water baptism? One's acknowledgement regardless of age. Okay, thank you, Lubega. What is, uh, can you qualify uh, the, uh, the two words, one's acknowledgement? What is the person acknowledging? Okay, anyone else? What did we learn about water baptism? What is this an expression of? What is it symbolic of? What are some of the things that we learned regarding water baptism? It is fulfilling the righteousness of God. It is uh, 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 an, a request for a good conscience. And it is also an identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you, John. So baptism is a symbol of our inner experience uh, of the death, burial, and resurrection uh, with Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you. What else is baptism? Any more answers? Okay, baptism is an expression of our decision to follow uh, Jesus Christ alone. Uh, it is that we have accepted him as our Lord and as our Savior. Uh, and like John Paul said, it's, uh, uh, it's a symbol of our inner experience of the death, burial, and resurrection with Jesus Christ. Now, we also saw that there is something, uh, you know, about water baptism that is uh, much bigger than just a repentance from sin. Uh, it was something that even the sinless uh, Lamb of God, uh, the sinless Son of God, who was the Lamb of God, desired to step into uh, what a baptism. Uh, it is actually an expression of the will of God that is being released on the earth. Uh, so everyone uh, who partakes in uh, water baptism 
uh, are actually saying yes to the will of God uh, and to the kingdom of God to be released here on the earth, to be released in and through their lives, their ministry, their vocation, their family, uh, their gifts, their talents. And so, you know, they would uh, step into uh, water baptism as an expression of their yes to God, yes to doing the will of God, uh, like John Paul said, uh, to fulfill all righteousness. That's basically saying yes to the will of God uh, and also saying yes to uh, being somebody who is going to release uh, uh, God's kingdom here on earth. Uh, it's basically releasing God's kingdom presence, his kingdom reign, his kingdom values, kingdom ethics, um, you know, uh, to bind on earth what is uh, uh, bound in heaven, to release on earth what is uh, released in heaven. So that is uh, the bigger picture of uh, the whole significance of uh, taking water baptism, which even Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, you know, the Lamb of God, uh, stepped into it with this, you know, bigger picture, with this bigger uh, significance. So even as... Uh, you know, we've taken water baptism, uh, you know, we've actually stepped into it, uh, saying yes to the will of God. And also we've stepped into it saying yes to, um, you know, ushering God's kingdom or extending his kingdom here on earth and building his kingdom here on earth. Okay. Now we look at the second uh, sacrament. What is the, the other sacrament? One is uh, water baptism. The other one is? What is the second sacrament that uh, the church observes? Thank you, Lubega. It's the Holy Communion. Um, it's the uh, Holy Communion or the Lord's Table. Uh, who instituted the Lord's Table? Who instituted the Lord's Table? Jesus. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Super Jesus. Jesus himself. Okay, and how do we know that it was Jesus who instituted the Lord's table or the Holy Communion? How do we know that? It is written in the Bible, but I've forgotten the, the chapter. <laughs> okay, thank you, Paul. It's in Matthew chapter 26. Uh, yes, Matthew chapter 26, verses 18 to 30. Uh, so can one of you please read Matthew chapter 26, verses 18 to 30. Anyone would like to read Matthew 26, 18 to 30, please? Matthew chapter 26, verse 18 to 30. He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When the evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But O oh, to the man who betrays the Son of Man, it would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of wine from now on, until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Thank you, Jeffina. So here uh, we see that uh, uh, Jesus instituted the Lord's table. He uh, took bread, he 
blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples saying, take eat, this is my body. And likewise, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And uh, he said, uh, drink, uh, you know, drink this, because this is the blood of the New Testament or the New Covenant, which is shed for the forgiveness of your um, sins. Okay, so we do this in remembrance of what Christ has asked us to do as you know, he said, do it as often as you remember me so we can do it often. Uh, you know, uh, is it okay that, uh, you know, we can partake in the Lord's table daily? For the, yeah, okay, yes, for some people partake in the Lord's table at home daily by themselves uh, because they want to break through, they want to see, uh, receive healing, uh, they want to just receive the full blessings of what uh, Christ has finished for them on the cross. They're pressing in, uh, they are pressing in for a breakthrough, they're pressing in for an answer, uh, they're pressing in for healing. And so, you know, people can take uh, a Holy Communion daily by themselves uh, because Jesus said you can do this as often as you uh, remember me, okay? Uh, so, uh, who can partake in the Lord's table? Who can partake in the Lord's table? Born again believers, yes. Uh, so, the uh, thank you, Zilatoli. Uh, Okay, uh, Zilatoli says, born again believers. Subhashish says, those who have taken baptism. And Jafina says, uh, every believer. Okay. Um, thank you for your answers. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm a little, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, good to qualify it by saying that those who are born again uh, believers, uh, because um, when we say just believers, there are people who are just nominal Christians, uh, you know, who go ahead and take uh, uh, the Holy Communion. Um, but it is more appropriate for those who are, uh, you know, born again believers, those who believe in Jesus Christ. It's also fine uh, that, you know, they take it so that they can, uh, you know, uh, uh, at least... Uh, you know, uh, God can work in their lives. Uh, they can see what they have received as a result of that. And that can at least uh, bring about uh, a change in, in themselves. So do you think that, uh, you know, it's only for born again believers or all believers can take uh, communion? What is your thoughts on that? All believers, I mean, by those who are just nominal Christians, uh, normal, I mean, by those who live like the world, the rest of the world does uh, so do we qualify and say it's only those who are born again believers or do we say even those who are just believers can take part in the communion? What are your thoughts on that? I think everyone who believes Jesus died for their sins can take part of the Lord's table. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so when John Paul and you say those who believe that Jesus died for their sins, you're not necessarily saying they have to have uh, a personal experience, a born again experience with Jesus Christ. Uh, I mean to say, if they know that Jesus died for their sins and they experience it, I think it's already part of it. Uh, okay, they're part of being born again. Okay. Uh, Lubega says, only those who are born again believers can you uh, qualify your answer and say why you say only born again believers? Yes, go ahead, Lubega. I really think it's all about doctrine. Because even the Muslims believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So if I really say that every believer in Christ will take the Holy Communion, that will mean that everybody will come onto the table. But uh, 
because of doctrine, Muslims have something they lack uh, as far as their doctrine is concerned. Let me say, they believe that Jesus Christ, of course, died died for the sins, but they they remove that nitty gritty which believes that Jesus Christ is a true son of Jesus of God. So once you remove that in into the mix, you've lost the entire point. So that's why I'm saying that you must be a born again believer. You, you, you believe that he was, you must believe the, everything. Let me say, you must believe the air, the soil, the, everything of Jesus Christ. You must believe that he was, he came here, he was a God. He was a born of a Virgin Mary. He is the only way to God. The, everything, everything. The cross, you must believe. You don't say that it was Judas Iscariot who was, who was, who was done what? Who was crucified on the cross. You must believe everything. You take it, it all, not part of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Lubega. Um, Susila Toli says, I think only those who are born again believers because we need to partake in the communion in a worthy manner. Uh, yes. Uh, so yes, those only who are born again believers uh, when they partake in the uh, Holy Communion, you know, they receive the full benefits uh, of uh, what Jesus has completed and done on the cross. Because Paul, when he's writing in First Corinthians uh, uh, chapter uh, 11, when he's saying that, you know, um, you, you know, if you uh, don't take part of it in a worthy manner, then you, that's why you see many of you uh, dying very young. And, uh, you know, there's so much of sickness in your body. Um, which shouldn't be uh, if you take part uh, of it in a worthy um, manner. But here we see that even the church at Corinth, they, uh, they knew the whole significance of uh, what they are partaking in, that it was the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ, but they were not partaking of it in a worthy uh, manner. So uh, I think it applies in both ways. Uh, we can't say, uh, we can't support people who say that, you know, if um, a person who is, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, not born again and they partake, at least, you know, they experience the benefits of the cross and that will turn them to repentance, uh, to sin. But it's just uh, doing that as a ritual. Uh, it's just uh, when they're not even able to, uh, you know, acknowledge uh, what Christ has done and accept that as part of their own lives and uh, consec consecrate their lives uh, for what Christ has done, uh, live in, uh, you know, uh, 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 in, in, in thanksgiving for what he has done, then, you know, just taking part in the Lord's table as a ritual so that, you know, uh, thinking that their sins would be forgiven is equal to an unbeliever who goes to a river or goes to a holy place uh, just for his sins to be washed away so that he can, uh, you know, his uh, uh, sins are cleansed. But we know that, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, salvation is in no other name but the name of Jesus. And there's no forgiveness of sins other than uh, believing uh, confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that Jesus died for you. Uh, so we need to believe and confess. Um, so we need to take part in the Lord's table in a worthy manner. And uh, also for those who are, you know, uh, who are born again, uh, it's also important for us to uh, remember that we need to partake in the Lord's table in a worthy manner so that uh, we can, you know, receive the full benefits of the cross. It also doesn't become a ritual for us, those who are born again, uh, you know, doing that as, uh, 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 as something that is very ritualistic. But also we do that, uh, you know, uh, each time we do it, we uh, remember what Christ has done for us on the cross. We thank him and uh, we receive, uh, appropriate whatever he's done uh, uh, for into our lives yes paul you have something to say yes i think also from from the name it is self it's a, it's a holy communion there should be an Ill element of holiness we only worship and praise god in holiness so that is very very important so not everyone should, should be there we should go there when you are holy can't go to his table when you are dirty thank you yes uh, thank you. So uh, even Jesus said that, you know, uh, if you 
going to the table and you have something against your brother, leave your offering there, go back, you know, ask for a forgiveness, um, you know, and uh, come back to the altar. So it's important that, uh, you know, even uh, we who are born again, uh, when we partake in the Lord's table, we need to also remember that, you know, we need to take part of it in a, a worthy manner. You know, uh, of course, we have asked for forgiveness of sins, but we have done things that uh, consciously or unconsciously that has grieved the heart of God. So we ask for forgiveness um, and uh, we just receive uh, what he has uh, finished for us on the cross, what he has done, what he's purchased for us on the uh, cross. Okay. Uh, so celebrating the Lord's table is an expression of our personal faith uh, in the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's also a proclamation of uh, we're just proclaiming uh, what Christ has uh, done for us on the cross, uh, what he has purchased for us on the cross, what he has redeemed for us, what he has taken back uh, for us from Satan. So we are proclaiming uh, what he has done. And uh, we know that every proclamation that we make, every uh, decree that we make in the name of Jesus and what he has uh, completed, what he has done for us, it's very powerful in the spiritual realm. And hence, we can expect to receive uh, the power of the cross just invading our lives, uh, even as we partake in the Lord's uh, table. Uh, we also, when we partake in the Lord's table, we are expressing our faith in his coming again. Uh, and it's also an expression of our union with Jesus Christ. We read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 16. So can one of you please read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, please? First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Thank you, John. So it's an expression of our union with Jesus Christ where we are declaring a communion, our union, our fellowship with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, with Christ himself. It's also our expression of our union uh, with one another, with others in the body of Christ, with other believers, with other saints. Uh, uh, the same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the following verse, verse 17. Can one of you read that, please? First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 17. Can one of you please read? First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 17. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Thank you, Jeffina. So though we, uh, you know, we are many, but, uh, you know, uh, we are one body in Christ. We partake of that one bread. Um, and so, you know, it is also expressing our uh, union with one another, our unity as one body in Christ Jesus, uh, just as, uh, you know, it's also an expression of our union uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, Lubega says that Jesus Christ is a whole package, believe in all his doctrine, not part of it. Yes, very true. So we need to, uh, you know, when we believe, we believe and accept everything. We walk in, uh, uh, in all that he has done for us, declaring everything that he has done for us, proclaiming everything that he has done for us and receiving uh, it. And we can receive it only when... Um, we are uh, uh, in union with him when we are one uh, with him, okay? Uh, because, uh, you know, this uh, chapter says we can't uh, drink the 
the cup of uh, uh, blessing and we can't drink the cup of Satan. We can't be, you know, on uh, on the fence, so to say, on the wall, on either side, you know, just sometimes jumping to this side when we want to receive blessing, sometimes the other side because the way that we want to live, it is, yes, uh, we believe uh, uh, in Jesus Christ or, you know, and we, uh, we receive the whole blessings or we don't believe and uh, we receive the uh, uh, you know the curses for because we are part we are drinking the cup of Satan and uh, we will read that in uh, in First Corinthians. Okay, uh, so we look at um, uh, we saw that uh, it's an expression of our union with Jesus Christ and it's also our expression uh, with our union with one another. Uh, but when we partake in the Lord's table, we need to prepare our hearts. Uh, how do we prepare our hearts when we partake in the Lord's table? How do we prepare our hearts when we partake in the Lord's table? We just examine our lives. Uh, we renounce any known sin that we have committed knowingly, unknowingly, consciously, unconsciously. And then when we take the elements, uh, we understand, uh, yes, thank you, Lubega, repentance of sin. We also understand and believe what they represent. They represent the, uh, the, uh, the death and the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. Uh, we believe that and we receive the blessings. Okay. Uh, so in celebrating the Lord's table, we can expect the full blessings of the cross. Uh, we can receive salvation, healing, deliverance, wholeness, uh, receive sozo, which is a whole, uh, you know, gift package that uh, Christ has purchased for us. We can uh, receive it. It can be released into our lives and we can see uh, the power of the cross being manifested in and through our lives. Now we come to Paul talking about uh, partaking in the Lord's table in a worthy um, manner. Uh, now, uh, you know, he writes this to the church at Corinth. Now, why do you think that he's talking about uh, this to the church at Corinth? Any idea anyone has? In First Corinthians chapter 10, and in also he talks about First Corinthians chapter 11. Why is he addressing this to the church at Corinth? Any idea? Okay, so we look at, um, you know, the issues that were uh, uh, at, you know, that was at the Church of Corinth and why Paul is writing to them uh, and what is he addressing about uh, this issue of partaking in the Lord's table uh, in a, or in the Holy Communion in a worthy manner. Uh, so one of the issues Paul is addressing is the behavior of people at the church at uh, Corinth. Um, and there were uh, two ways in which they were violating uh, the Lord's table. Um, and the first thing is they were partaking of the Lord's table, uh, which was their act of worship. And they were also partaking in the foods that were offered to idols as an act of worship towards the idol, uh, which Paul calls as idolatry. And he writes about this in First Corinthians chapter ten, verses fourteen to uh, thirty-three. Um, so we see that uh, you know he's uh, he's saying that you can't partake in both these tables in the Lord table, Lord's table, and also go and partake in the food that has been offered to an idol because it's not just about eating the food. Uh, it's okay to just eat any kind of food, which he writes uh, here in First Corinthians chapter 10. But he's saying that, you know, when you eat that food, you're actually uh, doing it as an act of worship towards the idol. You're giving reverence, significance to the idol. It's not about just eating the food. The food is not very significant, but what you're doing is very significant in the terms that it, you know, you're showing reverence to the uh, idol. Uh, and it's also a form of your worship towards uh, the idol, which he calls idolatry. And he says, even if you don't, um, 
have this in mind that okay i'm not eating it because you know i'm worshiping the idol or i'm giving it reverence uh, but if uh, a new believer who's come into the church sees you who's a mature believer so called mature believer somebody who's uh, you know been in part of the church uh, for some time now when they see it then you know they also are going to follow likewise uh, uh, and they also are going to learn from this and hence he asked them to stop the this practice uh this practice was very prevalent because you know uh, most of them who were believers who were part of the church now uh came from uh you know pagan backgrounds where they were worshiping uh, idols so he uh, writes about this he addresses this issue in first corinthians chapter 10 verses 14 to 33 uh, can one of you please read that please quickly first corinthians chapter 10 verses 14 to 33 First Corinthians chapter ten verses fourteen to thirty-three. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to the sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. It is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ, and is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many or one body, for we all share the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifice of the pagans, or offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the demons too. You can. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than He? I have the right to do anything you say but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience but if someone says to you this had been offered in sacrifice then do not eat it both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience i'm referring to the other's person conscience not yours for why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience if i take part in the meal with thankfulness why am i denounced because of something i thank god for so whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do do it all for the glory of god do not cause anyone to stumble whether jews greeks or the church of god even as i try to please everyone in every way for i'm not seeking my own good but the good of many so that they may be saved Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. So the real, real problem here is not with the food, but like I said, it's with the reference that has been given uh, to the idol uh, in so eating something that has been offered to the idol. So it's becoming like a stumbling block to new believers. So Paul is asking them uh, not to partake uh, in. uh you know uh the the table or the or the food that uh, has been offered to uh, uh to idols because he says very clearly you can't partake uh in um, uh, in the lord's uh, the cup of the lord and the cup of the demons you cannot partake of the lord's table and of the table of uh, the demons because he says that uh, you know what has been sacrificed has been sacrificed to demons and not to god and it's kind of uh, fellowship with uh, demons because when we are uh, when we are taking part in the lord's table it's an expression of our union with christ or our communion with christ uh, so also when you partake in uh, the food that has been offered to demons he's saying it's like fellowshipping or it's like communion uh, with the uh, demons okay so that is uh, 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 the first issue that he is dealing with the church at corinth uh, about uh, partaking in the lord's table in a worthy manner uh, so do we also uh, you know partake uh, in uh, uh, in the food that is offered to idols and in the lord's table do we
not necessarily we don't uh, you know go and uh, you know get uh, uh, eat those uh, you know the the food that has been offered to idols but then you know there are various um, idols in our life which has taken precedence to uh, christ uh, which has uh, taken the center place in our lives and sometimes you know we are offering all of our time our, our energy uh, you know to that idol which is in our life, whether it is our jobs, whether it is uh, making more money, whether it is uh, uh, friends, whether it is worldly lifestyles, uh, which can become an idol and uh, which we can partake in, uh, you know, uh, in some of the food that is being offered to the idol in the sense like, you know, some of us can uh, go out with our friends and, uh, you know, indulge in, in, uh, in ungodly uh, lifestyle. Uh, which is not pleasing in God's sight. And so uh, we need to be more mindful. Uh, sometimes it can subtly come in, you know, where we are uh, giving place to idols in our life, even though we are born again. Uh, subtly, sometimes we can just uh, give precedence to other things or other matters. Um, and um, it can even be greed, it can even be pride, it can even be jealousy. And uh, hence, we need to take stock of that and, uh, you know, uh, partake in the Lord's table in a worthy manner where we renounce everything. Uh, we ask God for forgiveness. We make sure that he, uh, you know, is a center place of our lives uh, so that when we partake in the Lord's table, we can receive uh, what he has uh, uh, purchased for us, what he has completed for us on the cross. The second thing uh, is um, in what Paul writes about uh, about taking partaking in the Lord's table in a worthy manner is in First Corinthians chapter eleven. Um, anyone knows what he is talking about there? What he is discussing with the church at Corinth there? What was the problem or the issue? Any idea? In First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20 uh, uh, to 34, Paul is addressing this issue where they have made the Lord's table as a feast. You know, so they all bring uh, food and they they bring wine, uh, lots of wine, uh, because if you read, it says, you know, some of them are even drunk. So it's not just, uh, it, it's become like a feast. It's become like a fun thing where they enjoy. Uh, and it's also a sad thing because there are the rich who bring uh, their good, rich food and lots of it. And uh, they have their own circle where they sit together and eat and uh, enjoy their themselves and it is the poor people who you know hardly have anything or bring very little who are uh, uh, going unfed and uh, hungry okay and it's the rich who are eating well and some of them are getting drunk and uh, so he says uh, this is uh, this is not the way that you participate in the lord's table um so they had turned the Lord's table into some sort of feast, and uh, hence Paul is admonishing them that they to have they they need to discern that they are partaking in uh, the body, the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ, and they need to do it in a worthy manner. Um, you know, and he says, if you do it in a worthy manner, you will receive the full blessings of the cross in your lives, uh, which includes healing, deliverance, uh, you know, um, uh, prosperity. But if you don't really understand or pay attention to the significance of what uh, they're partaking in, then, uh, you know, they will miss receiving the blessings of the cross. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, they will miss receiving healing uh, for their bodies, deliverance from every demonic oppression in their minds, in their emotions. And that's why he says many of them are weak and ill, and some of them have even died young, which is, uh, which is not what God's will is for their life. So let's just read First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20 to 34, please. Can somebody read that? First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20 to 
Okay, First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20 to 34 says, Therefore, when you come together in one place, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. But I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks uh, judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Many sleep means many uh, die. For if we would uh, judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, uh, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. Now, in this context, um, you know, in First Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is rebuking the Corinthians for their selfish and their inconsiderate conduct in which they come together as a church. Uh, because he says, when you meet together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with, one, with his own meal, and one is hungry and another is drunk. So this is what Paul means when he talks about those who eat and drink, uh, you know, without discerning the body, that they're taking part in the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And it's also an expression of our unity with one another. Do it in union, in communion, in fellowship with the whole body of uh, of uh, Christ because we are one. There's not the rich and the divide between the rich and the, uh, and the poor. There's no divide even among the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, so the problem at Corinth was not a failure for them to understand that the bread and the cup uh, represented uh, the body and blood of uh, Jesus Christ. They certainly knew about this, but the problem was their selfish, inconsiderate conduct towards each other uh, while they were partaking in the Lord's table. Uh, therefore, it's important, you know, and if we don't understand or we are not discerning the true nature of the church, as uh, uh, they were not discerning the true nature of the church as one body in uh, Christ. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, he says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So we do it in unity and in um, oneness. Uh, and if you note here, the phrase not discerning the body means uh, actually not understanding the unity uh, and interdependence of the people in the church, which is the body of uh, Christ. So he's saying you're not only taking part uh, in a worthy manner in the sense of, uh, you know, um, uh, doing it in a way to, uh, as a means to receive um, uh, what Christ has done for you, but also you're doing it in an unworthy manner because you're not doing it in unity. You're not doing it in um, oneness, okay? Uh, uh, and it's not giving, uh, uh, you know, thought to uh, others, to our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. So when we come together uh, and when you come together and partake in the Lord's table, uh, we need to reflect this character of unity and uh, oneness, uh, you know, where we think uh, first about the other brother or sister before we think about our own um, selves. So that is what he is addressing as a second issue here about uh, them being selfish and inconsistent 
consider it and also you know uh, uh, partaking it uh, as a feast and not fully uh, uh, you know uh, uh, doing it in a manner where they can receive the uh, full significance of what Jesus has done for them on the cross okay so those are the two issues that he deals with in first corinthians chapter 10 and first corinthians chapter 11 okay uh, that is why in our churches you know we uh, we wait till everyone has received the bread uh, the wafer or uh, everyone received the 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 cup the grape juice or in some traditional churches where we go at the altar you know we receive individual cups uh, and we wait for everyone to be served. And then everyone who is at the altar, when they have all received it, then they, uh, you know, they, the, uh, the pastor prays and all of us receive it to uh, gather at the altar. Okay. I know there are some churches where uh, they just come one by one and, uh, you know, I think they drink from that one uh, big cup. Um, but this is a practice where we do it together in unity and in oneness. Uh, so, you know, uh, and also do it with, uh, uh, you know, the whole uh, mindset that we are going to receive what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Now, what is the uh, requirement for uh, those, um, uh, you know, who want to receive um, uh, the Lord's table? Uh, there is only one requirement that, and there's nothing else, there's no explicit uh, instruction in scripture uh, that we must be water baptized before taking part in the Lord's table. Uh, so therefore, at All People's Church, uh, you know, we keep uh, the participation in the Lord's table open to those who are only born again uh, believers. Uh, so only those who are born again believers uh, can partake in the Lord's table. Uh, there's also no explicit age restriction in scripture that we see uh, uh, when a person should be baptized in water or when a person can partake in the Lord's table. Uh, the only requirement is that a person be born again, uh, they become a believer uh, through their personal faith in Christ Jesus, and uh, they're welcome to uh, be baptized in water or to partake in the Lord's table. So even in our children's church, uh, you know, we give, uh, uh, the, we uh, have Holy Communion, um, and we give it to children who are above uh, grade six, uh, but not to all children who are in above grade six, but uh, only to those children who have uh, uh, you know, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal savior. We speak to their parents about this. Uh, and if their parents say, yes, they've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, we want them to have a holy communion. Uh, we only give it to uh, um, to children above grade six. I, I have it intentionally for children above grade six so that they can actually know the significance of what they're partaking in. Uh, they are a little mature enough to understand so they can partake in a worthy manner. And of course, when before we give it to them, we uh, teach them, uh, we speak to them, uh, uh, we share uh, a, a bit about the Lord's table and all the children sit and listen uh, but when we serve uh, the elements we uh, serve it only to those who are born again uh, and those who are above grade six okay so that is what we practice at all people's church um, we just give it to those who are born again and not necessarily those who are uh, baptized they can be born again but not water baptized uh, but we still give them the uh, let them partake in the Lord's table so that they can experience the full benefits of the cross. Okay, uh, any questions about the water baptism and the Lord's table? Any questions? Any comments you'll have? No. Okay. Uh, do you, okay. Thank you, Lubega. Okay. Any uh, thoughts you'd like to, or any feedback about the assessments thus far? Please feel free to share your feedback about the assessments.
do you think there are quite a lot of uh, you know um, statements for each uh, uh, question options to choose from or do you think it's fine it's okay I'll repeat my question for each um, uh, in, in the assessment for each question. Do you think there are a lot of uh, statements that have been given? A lot of options. Okay, it's okay. Anyone else? Please share your feedback on assessments. Do you think I can follow the same format for the last assessment? Is it okay? Uh, Ma'am. Uh, I have a question, like uh, for assessment, so we have around five uh, to six options. So if suppose I mistake, uh, mistakenly like take the wrong answer, so all my answers will be wrong because it carries six or five marks. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I know that's the concern for most students, but that is how it has been uh, designed. Uh, and the reason behind that is because it's an open book uh, uh, assessment. Uh, and all of the statements and all of the answers are in uh, the, uh, in, in the uh, text. Uh, so it just requires a little more uh, reading. Um, you know, uh, and that is one way that all of you will read, and these are important theological truths. Uh, and also, it's a reasonable way to understand uh, uh, how well the student has comprehended. Because you know, it's uh, I understand if you do that, if it's a closed book exam, this is an open book exam, you have three days time. Uh, there are just a few short, a uh, few lessons, not much of notes as well for the lessons, uh, you know, and I think it's, uh, uh, you know, it's important that uh, since an open book exam, this is the best way to evaluate a student's comprehension, uh, because we also give you considerable uh, three days to do it. Uh, and that is how it has been uh, designed. Uh, so we just follow as faculty, we follow the format. Yeah, I know that's a concern for most students, but uh, considering that it's an open book exam, all the answers are there in the, uh, you know, uh, 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 in the content that has been given, uh, it's a reasonable way that we could understand uh, the student's comprehension. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Abu Bakr. I think uh, uh, I, I intentionally put in a lot of options because I know many students are really busy. Uh, they have 10 classes, they have their own um, uh, vocations, their own jobs. Uh, there's just no time to read it. So I just put in those deliberately those uh, statements so that important statements so that at that time when I at least reading it, trying to examine it, whether it's a true answer, right, wrong answer, and thus uh, learning is reiterated and some of the foundational truths which I think which are important for a theological student to know. Uh, I just hope that through this uh, assessment will be a good exercise for you all to, uh, to remember uh, and to know the foundational truths uh, because people are going to look up at you as theological students who have uh, come out with a degree. So at least these statements, you know, would know in your mind would remain as truth as facts because you're going to look at it, whether it's a true answer or a wrong answer. Yeah. Yes, uh, Lubega, you had your hand up. Uh, it's always not easy for having been a, having a teacher, a teacher background, but uh, you see, like the assessment of Christology, which I think has deadline of tomorrow, uh, has a question which has six marks. And uh, another one there has three around. There are two questions, if not three, questions where if you miss a mark on those two, three questions, you go way below 18 out of 30. Now, I would uh, advise that uh, it would be another question, but uh, instead of one question having six, why it can be, let it be three questions to have two, two, two marks. <laughs> but uh, if 
I, I tell you the truth, I spent almost 12 hours on that one question. And I, my wife was like, you old man, you can't sleep. And I, but I don't know whether I even still got it right. But because you get worried when you're going to submit, you say, in case I miss a mark here, I'm gone now. I will go the last time I almost got zero. And now if I, <laughs> again, this one, I fail. So I don't know, but it is good. But you keep in books, but uh, it is so hard. Let's, it's part of being a student. Thank you, teacher. Uh, thank you, Rubega. I uh, I will take that. I think yes, yeah, six marks is quite a, a a lot of marks for a student to lose. Uh, uh, sorry, I I missed out that. I didn't consider that. Uh, but thank you for pointing it out. I will make sure next time it'll just be like uh, two or three marks so that you know it really doesn't really pinch the student or uh, leave them uh, uh, you know uh, in um, uh, single digit uh, marks. Yeah, I'll I'll make sure I do that next time. Okay. Okay. Thank you all for your feedback. I've taken five minutes of extra time. Uh, thank you for joining class today. I'll see you all on uh, Friday. Have a blessed uh, day. God bless all of you. Thank you, everyone.